In this final video in the series, we take another look at Big O notation, this time in practice through the lens of a computer game. So this video assumes you're already familiar with the concepts of Big O notation. We have two previous videos on that, so if you've not seen those, go back and watch those first. So let's look at the concepts of Big O notation in practice through the lens of video game development. In particular, we're going to focus on various collision detection techniques. Most video games require some kind of collision detection. In this example, we have a player controlled spaceship that can fire a missile at an alien ship. For now, we're going to say we only have one alien ship and one missile on screen at a time. A simple way of detecting if a missile has hit the alien ship or not would be to check if the two objects intersect each other. We could draw an imaginary hitbox around the missile and the alien to see if the two boxes overlap. This is very simple mathematics and would not be difficult to program. Let's assume that when the player missile hits the alien ship, it disappears and another one spawns. As we only have one missile and one alien on the screen at a time, the time complexity of the algorithm is never going to change. It's always going to be constant O1. Let's imagine we now increase the challenge so the player has multiple alien ships to fire at, but can still only fire one missile at a time. Now we'd need to check the missile hitbox against the hitbox of a every alien ship in play. And we could use a simple for loop to achieve this as shown here. As we now need a for loop to carry out collision detection, the time complexity is increased to linear or ON. As the number of alien ships increases, so does the time complexity of the algorithm. Let's make the game even more interesting by allowing the player to fire missiles as quickly as they can. Now we have a situation with multiple missiles and alien ships on the screen at the same time. From an algorithmic perspective, we have a problem. We now need to check missiles against every alien ship. And we could do this using a nested loop as shown here. Although it seems simple to code, we've increased the time complexity by doing a loop within a loop to polynomial or quadratic ON squared. We've increased the complexity of the game, making it more fun. However, in doing so, we've increased the time complexity from constant to linear through to polynomial. And we already know that polynomial time complexity should be avoided. We might not notice the algorithm's poor performance if we only had a small number of missiles and alien ships. But as the game starts to scale, we will start to notice an ever increasing performance issue. So is there a better way can we reduce the time complexity back down towards linear, while at the same time keeping the fun of having multiple missiles and aliens on the screen at once? Well, there's a number of techniques video games developers can use. And although these techniques are well beyond the specification, we're going to take a look at one approach now. This is a good example of how programmers consider the time complexity of algorithms and the impact they have on performance. The concept we're going to look at is known as spatial partitioning using quad trees. The idea behind spatial partitioning involves dividing the game screen up, for example, into four quadrants. By doing this, we can handle each quadrant on the screen separately. We know the objects in the top left quadrant are the only ones that can really collide with each other. In a similar way, objects in the other quadrants are the only ones that can collide with each other. By taking this sort of approach, we significantly reduce the number of objects we need to check, reducing the overall time complexity behind the collision detection algorithm. Programmatically, you could implement this using a loop that checks all the alien ships, decides which quadrant each ship is in, and arranges the ships into lists for each quadrant. 
It can do the same thing for the missiles, add them all into a list depending on where they are. At a simple level, we could end up with say four lists, one for each quadrant, with each list containing the details of the objects, the missiles and aliens, located inside that quadrant. The collision detection algorithm now only needs to check the objects in each list against all the other objects in that list. If an object spans more than one quadrant, you could simply add it to multiple lists as appropriate. Now, although at first this approach seems to help with the time complexity, it won't take long until a crowded quadrant starts to suffer from the same problem as before. Remember, checking every item in a quadrant against every other item in that quadrant uses a loop within a loop, which is polynomial time complexity, which scales poorly. So if necessary, each quadrant can be further divided into smaller quadrants. For example, if the number of objects in that quadrant starts to become too large. The spatial partitioning algorithm using quad trees is extremely efficient. You could literally have thousands of objects on screen moving simultaneously and the collision detection algorithm would still perform extremely well. An effective spatial partitioning algorithm could process the collision detection of thousands of objects much quicker than a far smaller set of objects using the original loop within a loop approach across the entire screen. Here's an example of the spatial partitioning algorithm using quad trees in practice. Studying the image, you can see how few objects will need to be checked against each other in any one particular area. It's clear how effective this test technique is at reducing the number of unnecessary comparisons and the overall time complexity of the collision detection algorithm. This is just one small example of big O notation in practice. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key questions. What is big O notation and how can we use it to help classify the complexity of algorithms? And what are some of the practical applications of big O notation? So just before we leave you, we want you to make you aware of our completely free big O notation cheat sheet. This is a two sided sheet. It goes through all the various types of big O notation you need to know about, their descriptions, example codes and common uses. And on the back are the various best average and worst case tables that we've been using in these videos. This resource is freely available at student.craigandave.org. Simply scroll down and select A Level Revision. When you're there, you can just press download to get this cheat sheet along with others completely for free.